So, good evening everyone, and welcome to the third meeting of the Seminar of Comparative Medieval Material Culture, China, Islam, and Europe. Our semester began in a day-long conference on medieval Fustat, and then followed by a lecture, I think, only last week on the nomadic Turks in Inner Asia. And tonight we're getting to the last stop in this semester, all the way to, well, Italy, medieval West, um, to a lecture by Professor David Gantz. Dr. Gantz is, uh, holds the chair of medieval art history in the University of Zurich. He was a fellow at the Biblioteca Herziana in Rome and held numer numerous visiting professorships in universities such as Basel, Heidelberg, Konstanz, Bochum, and Jena. He was a member of the what is now legendary research group entitled Cultural History and Theology of of the image in Christianity that was led by Thomas Lentes in the University of Münster. And he was also recently a visiting scholar at Yale University in the Art History Department. Among his many avenues of research, Dr. Gans focuses on aspects of pictorial narrative, the nature of the foldable image, the plurality of images, the question of clothing as metaphor, as well as more mundane questions as of the history of the medieval book cover and its place in medieval art. He published on many aspects of this work, as well as on Baroque art and architecture. His recent book from 2008 on visions in Ottonian culture is now being translated into English and will come, I guess, in 2017, 18? <laughs> and it's be titled in English, Spaces of Revelation, Visions in Medieval Art. Most recently, and I actually brought the exemplar, most recently he took uh, the much neglected topic of the book cover in medieval art and published this beautifully written and beautifully investigated, but even as much as it's beautifully written and investigated, it's just beautiful book um, that was published, I think, in, with Reimer um, in Germany, and it's by far the be most beautiful book I've seen in medieval art in 2015, uh, which shows us that there is a future for book publishing, and especially book publishing about book publishing in the Middle Ages. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight's lecture um, has the um, very intriguing title of, and his raiment began shining exceeding white as snow, investments in the transfiguration. To those of you who are not versed um, in the King James Version of the Bible, raiment is a piece of clothing. So if you didn't do your homework or you didn't go to Sunday school, just that you know raiment is a piece of clothing. So without further ado, let us welcome David Gans to speak to us tonight. Thank you, David. Thank you so much, Itai, for your kind introduction. And thank you for invited me to, to speak here. I'm very glad to, to be here and to give this uh, lecture here. When Raphael died in April 1520, a strange kind of art exhibit was, prepa was prepared in honor of the papal pa painter and architect. The corpse of the artist was laid out in the Vatican Palace close to the big altarpiece on which he had worked until his death. Later in the 16th century, Giorgio Vasari gave a colorful description of the scene, and I quote, as he lay dead in the hall where he had been working, there was placed at his head the picture of the transfiguration, which he had executed for Cardinal de' Medici, and the sight of that living picture in contrast with the dead body caused the hearts of all who beheld it to burst with sorrow. <coughs> The unusual choreography was the perfect expression of the new cult of the artist that tended to set Raphael in parallel to Christ, the protagonist of his transfiguration painting. The proximity between the two seemed to be confirmed by the coincidence of the dates of death, since Raphael had expired on April 6, which was Good Friday of the year 1520. In his 1568 edition of his Vitae, Vasari would expand this issue in his discussion of the Transfiguration painting, stating that, and I quote, 
for whoever wishes to know how Christ transfigured and made divine should be represented in painting must look at this work. He clothed in snow white raiment with his arms out outstretched and his head raised appears to reveal the divine essence and nature of all the three persons united and concentrated in himself by the perfect art of Raffaello, who seems to have summoned up all his powers in such a manner in order to show the supreme force in his art and the countenance of Christ, that after finishing this, the last work that he has to do, that he was to do, he never again touched a brush, being overtaken by death. Even for Vasari, this exaltation, <clears throat> and here we see the uh, Christ figure uh, Vasari is uh, uh, describing in this passage, um, even for Vasari, this exaltation to the role of another Christ was only conceivable because the painter had so successfully mastered the challenge of outdoing his rivals. Just a few days before Raphael's death, the Transfiguration had been the object of another unusual exhibit when Sebastiano del Piombo had carried his altarpiece of the raising of Lazarus to the Vatican, putting it in front of his opponent's painting. As has often been stressed, the idea of rivalry or paragone between those two artworks went back to their commissioner, Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, who purposefully asked two concurring artists to create altarpiecing for the cathedral of his bishopric, St. Just in Narbonne. As has often been stressed, the Paragone with his Venetian rival was the decisive factor behind Raphael's choice to amplify the transfiguration scene by a parallel action. In the lower half of the painting, the nine disciples that did not accompany Christ on Mount Tabor failed to heal a demon-possessed boy brought to them by his kin. The addition of this scene gave Raphael the opportunity to create a bipolar structure with two focus points. Christ, who is radiating in bright splendor before the eyes of Jacob, Peter, and John, and whom the prophets Moses and Elijah testimony to be a theophanic medium and the lunatic boy whose appearance as a demonophanic medium puts the disciples in a state of agitation and perplexity. Due to this novel extension, Raphael was able to create, to create a kind of super history painting that combined multiple levels of action and perception and that therefore could be acclaimed to be by far superior to Sebastiano's simple story. Let me now switch to a second pair of images that consists of a transfiguration altarpiece created by a famous Renaissance painter in response to another image. Between 1534 and 1566, Titian painted his version of the transfiguration for the high altar of San Salvador a church located in the neighborhood of the Rialto Bridge, which had been one of the hotspots of Venice's sacred topography for centuries. Titian's is a particular altarpiece since it served as a movable, movable cover painting for another altarpiece from the late 14th century. On high festivities, Titian's painting disappeared underneath the altar and the so-called Pala d'Argento behind it got visible. Whereas the altarpieces for Nabon were radically non-site specific, both painters didn't know the distant place where the works would be installed, and after Raphael's death, Giulio de Medici decided to separate the pair, transferring the transfiguration to the Roman church of San Pietro Montorio. Titian's altarpiece was designed to fit into a configuration the Venetian art knew very well. Artists knew very well. Even today, his canvas is still in place and visible only in alternation with the late medieval altarpiece it normally conceals. These acts of hiding and revealing and the mechanics that they implied were Titian's point of departure for exploring the transfiguration story. In a certain sense, his approach moved in a continuity with older concepts of transformable objects 
that already had determined the design of the late medieval altarpiece. Now I come to my second point after this introduction, transfiguration and transformation. The reason why I'm particularly interested in images of the transfiguration in this talk is the dynamics of metamorphosis underlying this story, a dynamics of transformation that leads to short, to short infiltration of the immaterial in the material. As a background for my analysis, let me briefly sum up what the Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke tell us about the event. And sorry. Here we have Mark's uh, account. The story begins when Christ chooses three of the 12 disciples, Peter, John, and Jacob, and asks them to follow him on a high mountain that later came up to be identified with Mount Tabor. On this special site, close to heaven and isolated from the human world, a strange spectacle of supernatural phenomena evolves in essentially three acts. First, the body of Christ changes appearance, his garments become shining, and this we find only in uh, Matthew and Luke, his face starts gleaming. Second, this since long deceased prophets, Moses and Elijah, enter the stage and start talking to Christ. Christ appears to be dislocated in a space of scriptures now, of things once promised and now become real. Third, a cloud appears that eventually overshadows the actors. It is God's voice that comes out of it. Quote, this is my beloved son, listen to him. The audition adds an un ab um, unambiguous meaning to the visionary experience before. In the accounts of the three synoptic gospels, the transfiguration is the event that marks a rapture in the sequence of narration. The transfiguration story is not about deeds and words performed by Christ, but about a supernatural sign that happens to Christ. On Mount Tabor, Christ's divine nature becomes visible on and around his body. Now, what is relevant for my talk is not so much the complex and often disputed theological issue of Christ's two natures, but the materiality of transformation inherent to the transfiguration narrative. In their description of the event, the Gospels place emphasis on the garments as the very medium of the metamorphosis process. Whereas Luke and Matthew mention both Christ's face and dress Mark is the most radical under this aspect, eliding the face and mentioning dress alone. And his clothes uh, become radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. The motive of the radiating garments, interestingly, locates the process of metamorphosis on the surface and not in the body of Christ. In theological discussion, there had always been consensus that the very substance of Christ's body, a human body of flesh and blood, had not been altered or even dissolved in the course of this theophany. The body the disciples are looking at is not an airy or mere spiritual appearance. In this respect, the process of transfiguration is the exact opposite of the process of transubstantiation, where the substance and not the appearance is believed to change. Mark's comparison to the work of a fuller, an embarrassing passage for many interpreters, evokes the artisanal labor of cleaning garments by the use of water, fuller earth, and urine, a work that until the high middle ages was normally performed by walkers walking bare feet on the clothes. Thus in Mark, the garments becoming a medium of the divine are related to an image of driving out dirt and color from a fabric produced by human hands. The very exteriority and materiality of the garments made them an interesting starting point for depicting the transfiguration using earthly materials. The potential of such a perspective on the garments and on bleaching as a metaphor for radiance can be immediately grasped when we look back once more at Raphael. Basically, the Roman painter's Paragone with Sebastiano del Piombo was about the artist's capability, and here I have to go back 
to, sorry, here. Uh, basically, uh, yes, the Roma, Roman painter's paragone with uh, Sebastiano del Piombo was about the artist's uh, capability to push the pictorial representation of a storia to the maximum, fathoming the limits of telling stories with human bodies. Raising a dead body, as in the case of Sebastiano, was an old metaphor for the artist's work. Transfiguring a human body into a divine splendor could be seen as a parable for art's capacity to master even more sophisticated tasks. In Raphael's painting, Christ's white garment is the medium that exempts him from gravity and allows him to hover in the air without depriving him from his solid solidity. The removal of dirty color is a symptom for the detraction of weight that can be perceived in the other garments of the paintings. Furthermore, drawings made by Raphael and his workshop demonstrate that in a very late stage of the preparatory process, all actors of the storia were studied as naked bodies. These naked figures were also integrated into drawings that recorded the overall composition. This is one uh, of Raphael's drawing for the upper half of uh, the uh, composition, and this uh, one shows uh, the entire uh, composition. The fact that some of these sheets have a grid proves that the face of an undressed storia immediately preceded the execution of the painting on the wooden panel. Hence, one could say that Raphael conceived the transition from drawing to painting as process of dressing up the lines of disegno with color. As a painter, Raphael acted as a tailor and dyer, using the copiousness of antique tunics and mantles as a screen for different colors. This becomes even more evident in the central figure of the transfigured Christ, which was even underpainted as a nude without dress. In this case, the transformation from new drawing to the dressed painting was performed on the wooden panel of the altarpiece itself. Making Christ lifting up in the air, <coughs> Raphael's white garment can be said to be an allegor allegory of creating images by projection. In concurring with Sebastiano, Raphael treated his picture as projection screen for bodies that are by, by definition weightless, resembling clouds such as the white shining cloud behind Christ. Against this concept of the image as a space for projection of bodies formed by the artist, I'd like to put the pair of altarpieces for San Salvador in, Ven in Venice as an example for widely diffused concepts of images that first of all have to be made visible by unfolding or lifting them. Both Titian's canvas and the late medieval silver pala are transformable images integrated into mechanical devices or image machines whose activation made them appear and disappear. In this constellation, the drama of transfiguration could be used to unfold a different potential of exposing the status of the image as a shining yet material garment. We we'll come to now to my third point, image machines. To the present day, Titian's altarpiece is assembled into what, what I would like to call an image machine, a mechanism of ropes, gears, and a counterweight that puts the painting into vertical motion. A slot in the pedestal behind the altar allows this monumental canvas painting, the measures are as you can see here, uh, to, um, point 40, 2 meters per point 45 per uh, 2.97 meters or 96.5 per 117 inches. Since the Renaissance altar is elevated by four steps, and we perhaps can see this better on the next Since the Renaissance altar is elevated by four steps, there is enough space above the floor level of the sanctuary for hiding the painting. In the early modern period, the image machine was activated, activated five times per year. Besides 
the Feast of the Transfiguration on August 6th. This happened on the festivities of Christmas, Easter, Ascension, Pentecost, and Assumption of Mary. Only on these days, the late medieval pala from the late 14th century would have been visible on the high altar. The stone framework into which the image machine is integrated and okay, was created during our spectacular rebuilding of San Salvador. Mm, well, so I can get, go ahead. San Salvador, projected by Pietro and Tullio Lombardo, a campaign made possible by an endowment of prior Antonio Contarini in 1506. After several interruptions, construction work had been completed around 1530, and in 1534, the stonemason Guglielmo de Grigi put his signature on the most important liturgical furniture of the sanctuary, the high altar lavishly decorated with marbles and crowned by a statue of the resurrected Christ. At this point, planning of the altarpiece that should constitute the focal point of a solemn nave surmounted by three domes, must have been already underway. At which time exactly um, this altarpiece was ex executed by Titian is a matter of dispute, most scholars tending to assigning it a late date in the early 1560s. But this is of no particular relevance for my analysis. In any case, Titian's cr uh, Titian created his painting as part of a new presentation mechanism for the older pala. But what do we know about the presentation of the Pala di San Salvador before the rebuilding of the church? The answer of, to this question has to, be, to remain fragmentary since the medieval predecessor of the extant church has been completely demolished and its visual documentation is scant, not providing us detailed information about the inner disposition of the building. On the other hand, the pala itself is an image machine of its own. In its actual shape, it is my, made of five horizontal compartments revetted with gilt silver. The lowermost and the uppermost element are additions from, an early, from the early 18th century that should adjust the pala to the format of the Renaissance framework. From sources, we know that in the 16th century, painted wooden panels were made to serve this aim. The remains are conjunct with eight hinges, elevated borders that protected and folded. The late medieval pala was 660 pounds. I have no images uh, that can. The dissemination of similar apparatus in Italy. In the Venetian lagoon area, we know of a larger group of silver pale, many of whom were used as foldable objects. Some of these have a simple diptych structure that could be closed by turning down the upper panel. Does this function as a pointer as well? So here you have to imagine the hinges in this case. This is uh, the Pala d'Argento from uh, Grado Cathedral. And uh, here another example, uh, a gilt wooden altar piece, which could be folded down here. As in the case of the, so this is a simple diptych structure that could be closed by turning down the upper panel. As in the case of the Pala di San Salvador, it is not entirely clear what happened to these objects once they were closed, whether they were, they were brought into the sacristy or whether textile hangings or painted panels were installed in front of them. The only case in which we dispose of more detailed information is the mother of all Venetian pale, the Pala d'Oro in the Dos Chapel of San Marco. Since its amplification in the early 13th century, the pala had been a foldable or altarpiece comprising a central panel and a wing on the upper side that could be closed. 
Differently from the Pala d'Argento in San Salvador, the Pala d'Oro needn't to be lifted up in this moment and would have been remained on the altar all time. In 3040, 1340, Paolo Veneziano created a Pala Feriale, painted on wood that would have hidden the Pala d'Oro when its upper wing was closed. And Yes, here we see some views uh, from the 18th and 19th century with uh, here the open um, Pala Feriale on the high altar of San Marco and here uh, the unfolded uh, Pala d'Oro. The Pala Feriale consisted of two panels, which again were joined by hinges and therefore foldable. And here is a reconstruction uh, by uh, Andrea De Marchi, which shows this uh, quite uh, complex uh, mechanism of, un uh, of folding, uh, first folding the Pala Feriale and then unfolding uh, the Pala d'Oro. So, um, together with the Paladoro, to whose upper wing it was attached, Veneziano's panels were part of a highly sophisticated image machine that could be activated through ropes. First, it would have closed the Pala Feriale and then lifted it up, unfolding at the same time the Paladoro. As foldable objects, Venetian Pale share a clear preference for vertically mounted hinges. In the broader context of foldable altar pieces, but also foldable images in general, this is an extremely intriguing feature, which so far has been completely ignored by scholarship. It seems necessary, therefore, to stress the difference between turning wings horizontally and vertically. In the first case, the weight of the wings is sustained by the hinges. So if we go back again to uh, this uh, triptych, um, the weight of the wings is sustained by the hinges and their movement will be relatively effortless. In the second case, movable parts have to be lifted up and lowered by supporting part of their weight, an action that requires much more energy and in some cases the use of external mechanical, mechanical <coughs> devices. Not by chance, objects of everyday life, such as doors and windows, are usually designed for horizontal movement. As Lynn Jacobs has shown, late medieval triptychs were known for being images with doors, which therefore constituted a crucial semantic reference for these foldable objects. For the vertical hinges of Venetian altarpieces, by contrast, objects as, uh, such as chests whose lids opened vertically might be a relevant clue. But what is still more important is the fact that weight may become such an issue in this configuration. San Salvador is unique in its trip experience. Visitor D'Argento was that, the, among other saints, when on the central axis of this altarpiece. Beneath the infant Christ and cry made during the last uh, restoration of the Pala d'Argento. Sitting directly below Christ, Peter is drawing back his left hand, thus expressing fear to touch Christ's feet. Christ's radiance is passing a borderline. It attracts the gazes of the three eyewitnesses, but induces them to move back and to shield their eyes. On a different register, the two prophets remain calm, venerating Christ in an upright position with crossed hands. Obviously, two modes of looking at Christ shall be, shall be represented here. Effective overwhelm and quiet contemplation. Placing a narrative scene in the center of a pala was an innovative experiment in the genre of the Venetian Pale d'Argento. Normally, the figure of Christ, Pantocrator, would have been sitting here, embodying the leader of the heavenly congregation. In San Salvador, instead, Christ is involved in a double process of transfiguration. He is transfigured on Mount Tabor, 
and he is transfigured on the opened altarpiece. The best way to understand this is to look at the central panel that composed the transfiguration. Other elements of the Gospels, the rocky surface of the wings. The temporalization can be, this temporalization can be read in two ways. It reminded viewers of the historical metamorphosis of Christ that allowed the three eyewitnesses a glimpse into future paradise. In this sense, the transfiguration is a visionary prefiguration of the visio beatifica of all saints. But equally important is the second reading of the transfiguration scene as a temporalization of the pala itself. This temporization goes in a different direction from Raphael's concept of painting as projection. It points to the altarpiece as heavy and foldable object. When the formation of the rocks with the disciples unfolds, it becomes a mediator for the donor kneeling beneath the disciples. Come to my fifth point, garments of light. Pictorial media with precious, shimmering surfaces possessed high relevance in the visual culture of late medieval Venice. In addition to treasure objects that were occasionally put on display on the altar, such as reliquaries, treasure books, altar clothes, and the Pala de Cento, the walls and the walls of the sanctuaries were extensively covered with mosaics that set their elements against a golden background. Late medieval sources inform us about mosaic decorations in the dome of the medieval church of San Salvador. In all these cases, light effects produced by shining materials were at stake. Through the reverberations of daylight that entered these interiors, filtered by narrow, narrow windows, and through artificial illumination by means of candles, churchgoers were offered a visual bodily experience of transcendence getting materialized. Speaking of image machines, therefore, means also speaking of light machines. It's hard to imagine a subject that is so suitable for dra dra dramatizing light effects as a transfiguration. Clearly, what the disciples see is a transfiguration by light. Very early, the role of light as an agent of Christ's metamorphosis had been given high emphasis in Byzantine art. In the Apes Mosaic of St. Catherine at Mount Sinai, to name just one of the best known and earliest examples Christ's metamorphosis is marked by the interplay between his white garment and a mandala motif in dark blue. Contrary to a natural light source, the mandala motif has its darkest point at the center. In addition to that, Christ is the origin of eight semi-transparent light beams that depart from the center of his body, cross the border of the mandala, and hit Moses, Elijah, and the three disciples, not in their face, as one would expect, but on their garments. One could say that here the transfiguration is visualized on a diagrammatic level that complements the figural world of the represented actors. actors. The inversion of dark and light areas produces a diagrammatic structure that visualizes the fundamental difference between divine and material light. As has been stressed by Jas Elsner, Gerd Wolf, and Barbara Schellewald, this model takes up a sophisticated theological discussion about the light nature of the pre-existent pre pre logos and its status as origin of the uncreated light. The difference between the sphere of represented bodies and the sphere of the diagram marks the discrepancy between the immaterial light of the logos and the material light that the mosaic stones received and reflected. Complementary to that, the light beams create a diagram of the mediation between both spheres. In comparison to this conceptual complexity, the Pala di San Salvador proposes a seemingly unimpressive solution for the pictorial represent representation of light. All around the standing figure of Christ, pointed stripes of gold foil have been attached to the background of the scene. On a material level, these signs for the flashing up of Christ don't differ from the remnant elements of the pala, for whom elements of embossed and chased golden silver foil have been used. 
also the architectural framework and the background with its ornamental patterns have been produced in the same manner. On the other hand, there were hardly any materials closer associated with light. Especially gold was commonly used for representing the uncreated light of heaven that was thought to be the light source in the transfiguration. Gold's brightness was considered to produce a perceptual analogy to the brightness of the celestial throne hall and also to the splendor of the heavenly Jerusalem. In this sense, gold had been considered to fulfill a bridge fun function for precious treasure objects. In San Salvador, a metonymic relation between the brightness of the transfigured Christ and the splendor emanating from the gold surface of the entire pala can be observed. When the altarpiece was opened, candlelight illumination would have been reflected on numerous points by the three-dimensionally modeled surface. Similar to other treasure objects, the light dramaturgy of the pala aimed at an effect of blinding its viewers, which made the figures shaped by the artist almost disappear. And here, uh, yes. Because, I mean, these, these of course, are uh, photographs uh, made in the studio, uh, so they are quite untypical for the situation in the church. Uh, here we see uh, other pictures which I uh, found uh, um, uh, on Google, uh, which uh, give some uh, idea of how uh, the Pada d'Argento looks like inside uh, the church. Not all viewers would have had this summary light-dominated perception. For some of them, taking a closer look at the pala would have been possible. For this small group, the materiality of the surface offered a subtle point. When the fire gilding of the silver foil was executed, and we see this here in, in this detail, all uncovered body parts, such as faces, hands, and feet, were left out. Over the entire altarpiece, then, the higher splendor of gold was linked to garments, and the lesser splendor of silver to the body. Of course, this particular treatment reminds, of, reminds us of Mark's description of the Transfiguration, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. Contrary to traditional Byzantine iconography, the light source of the transfiguration is not located behind the surface, behind the surface of Christ's body, but in its vestimentary cover. Such garments of light had been introduced to theological discourse by late antique authors such as Ephraim the Syrian, who argued that Adam and Eve had been clothed with such garments of light in paradise. Yet on the altarpiece, every single figure participates in this effect of becoming radiant. There is no difference in the treatment of the central Christ figure, the disciples, the saints, and the donor portrait of Francesco di Grazia. The Transfiguration story offered an author author authoritative very difficult, authoritative parable for a transformation process that made the material a medium of the immaterial realm. This association of precious metalwork with the garments of the transfigured Christ finds an interesting parallel in the history of the Georgian transfiguration icon in Sasma, I don't know how to pronounce that, which uh, recently had been discussed by Anthony Eastmond. According to the legend, the monk Serapion had brought the icon to the place where he founded the monastery of Salzma in the 9th century. At this place, the icon started to be venerated as a miraculous image, wherefore it received a revetment of gilt silver that left only the faces uncovered. So on the left, we see uh, um, the um, rest of uh, uh, the, this uh, original, um, original Revetment and on the right hand, um, um, uh, early modern copy of this uh, revetment. After that, pilgrims would have seen only the faces of the original icon and the remnant of the transfiguration as representation, representation on the revetment. 
obviously, this configuration would have contributed to a perception of the icon being transfigured by its radiant metal garment. In the end, we are told, veneration of the icon shifted to the redment, and the icon was replaced by a bare wooden board. Also in San Salvador, artists, patrons, and viewers considered the radiant garments as promise of participation. The donor of the altarpiece, Francesco di Grazia, had invested large sums in the investiture of the new pala, and therefore he could nourish hope for having a share in the process of transfiguration. The temporary display of the pala on the altar and the performance of unfolding the silver gold front out of bare wooden case acted as framework for this process of iterated involvement. My sixth and last point, Titian's Pala Feriale covering the transfiguration. In the new Renaissance building of the 16th century, the presentation of the Pala underwent a radical change. Key element of the new image machine was a canvas painting commissioned to Titian that would have covered the Pala d'Argento most time of the year. To the Venetian public of the period, Titian's canvas would have appeared as belonging to the old genre of the Pala Feriale, though interpreting it in a new, innovative way. The new Pala Feriale was not a foldable object anymore, and therefore needed extra space below stage when the Pala d'Argento should have been on display. The vertical movement of lowering and raising brought a different dynamics of image presentation into play, which has interesting parallels to movable flats used in theater. This shift in the mechanics of the image machine goes together with a paradoxical interpretation of the Pala Feriale's traditional function. Not only is the format of uh, this uh, painting remarkably taller than that of the pala, exceeding the latter by 26 inches, 66 centimeters, centimeters. Titian's painting is also repeating the pala's core subject, the transfiguration, where we could have expected an iconography that foreshadows the images on the pala. So this was the traditional constellation between uh, pala feriale and and Pala d'Argento. The fact that the Pala Feriale produces a vehement close-up of the transfiguration, lending it a much better visibility throughout the central nave than the Pala d'Argento with its multi-part composition and its relatively small uh, figures, seems to invert the logic of hiding and wheeling. To be clear, it is not my contention that we should understand Titian's painting as just an other paragone, this time be between old and new. On the contrary, what I am arguing for is that, in a certain sense, Titian is both too Venetian and too smart to define his position in these terms. The sharp contrasts that he produces between old and new are not part of a strategy of rupture with old image practices, but at their modification. Titian knew that the task of creating, of creating a cover painting would have allowed him to experiment with radical solutions that were unconceivable in autonomous altarpieces. All the features that strike us as original and revolutionary in his interpretation of the Transfiguration event were designed as being part of a cover that is related to a powerful object that it conceals. To name but a few characteristics. How the artist drives many elements that traditionally belong to a transfiguration out from the picture plane, above all the topographic scenery of Mount Tabor. How Christ is surrounded by figures that react overwhelmed to the burst of light emanating from his garment. Peter and Jacob being violently pushed back, Moses, Elijah, and John being attracted by this energy. How Jacob fulfills a 
powerful gesture of shielding his eyes against the light, a variation of the old gesture of aposcopane in traditional transfiguration iconography that now creates an extreme repoussoir effect between Jacob's giant hand and Christ's, sorry for that, Christ's here, uh, relatively small body. With regard uh, to the subject of the transfiguration, we could say that with these features, Titian stages his painting as radiant vestment for the pala. The key element is Christ's garment, which appears to be the principal agent of transformation. Like a sudden flash, it lightens up, and here I have another. Let me just look at these details. Yeah, this is better. Like a sudden flash, it lightens up in extreme brightness, which pushes painting to the limits of representation. Due to its inner energy, the other actors disappear into deep darkness. Uh, sorry. Go back to this. Jacob's gesture seems to make a vain attempt to touch Christ's garment. The brightness of this dress is a metaphor for painting's capacities to transform textiles by the use of brushes and pigments. Titian knew that these capacities would, have be, would be enhanced by the placement of the painting in front of the silver pallet. The very contrast in the altarpiece's materiality, the difference between easel painting executed with relatively cheap pigments on a textile support against a treasure object created with precious materials, a picture surface that claims to produce its own light and color against a shimmering surface that reflects the incoming light, all this is part of the play. In a way, Titian's palaferiale is both the fulfillment and the promise of what lies behind it. This paradoxical state, which comes close to what Marx, Mark writes about Christ's intensely white dress, became clear each time the painting was lowered. Only then the promise of the painting's illusion would have been fulfilled and the radiance of the golden garment of the altarpiece would have been visible. Looking at the descending movement of the painting and the reappearance of the Pala d'Argento must have been a magnificent spectacle. In this moment, the canvas seemed to follow the falling movement of Mark, <coughs> Peter, and John. When it was lifted up again, its pictorial energy was recharged, so to speak, and Christ's orientation upwards could take the lead. Once the process of lifting was finished, Moses presenting the tablets of the law, a foldable object, could be taken as an allusion to the old logic of foldability overcome by the painted Christ's brilliant reappearance. Yet we know that the early modern users of the high altar thought differently about that. Sources of the early 18th century tell us that the Pala d'Argento was still folded and locked when Titian's canvas was ho hoisted above the altar. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Tell us a little bit, I mean, it's the first time I started thinking about horizontal hinges, and, and is it fully a Venetian phenomenon, or, or do you know if it's elsewhere, and if so, where is the technology coming from, like in, in other spaces of horizontal folding? Do you have any thoughts on, on that? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, well, the problem is that, um, uh, about northern uh, triptychs in, in, uh, in Central Europe are well-studied well objects by, by now, but uh, those foldable objects uh, in use in Italy are much less uh, studied, so it could be also a problem of 
just knowing all these um, or not knowing not knowing uh, these objects but uh, it seems at least to be um, um, a local Venetian um, mm -hmm. special uh, thing these uh, I mean it's very very impractical uh, to create uh, foldable altarpieces in, in this manner especially uh, um, um, in the case of San Salvador, with, with this uh, low wing, um, <coughs> can't be moved uh, by, by the, the altar piece stands uh, on the altar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But of course, I mean, one idea behind this, uh, I have to, to study this a little bit more, uh, is that uh, Venice is. Uh, harbor uh, city and uh, ships are arriving so uh, there's also um, a practical need in everyday life for uh, such mechanisms um, using roads and uh, mm -hmm. uh, so on. And just on that, on that point, a, a piece of question uh, of information, I, I was really happy to learn the prehistory of this descending mechanism which I admit I'm familiar with from the altar of St. Ignatius in Rome. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Much yeah later. That's, uh, so I, I would love yeah. to know, it, is this in your research the earliest example? Is it something you connect with? The earliest? Venice, raising of sails, and <laughs> it, what, what is the yeah. that? That's <laughs> um, a good thought. And yeah, what, is the, yeah. what is the, are there intermediate examples between this and the Pozzo that I'm, I'm not aware of? I'd love to know more about that under the rubric of your image machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I knew the, the Pozzo as well, uh, and here, uh, well, yeah, this image machine is also still in use. Uh, you can when you go to recently, uh, yes, yes, recently, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Any earlier ones that you know of, or are you claiming this is the first, or just the first that survived? I'm not claiming that's the first. Of course not. <laughs> No, I mean, in, in, in many cases, uh, these um, mechanisms were destructed uh, afterwards. Uh, and uh, we have sources uh, informing us about um, uh, rolling, rolling up uh, altar pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, this was another other possibility, uh, which, uh, yes. So painted cloths that would simply some make samples like in, in northern Italy. Uh, of course, it's I mean it's damaging uh, uh, the the pictures, um, but it's the same procedure that would have been used when a painting had to be moved to another place. Of course, it would have been uh, canvas painting would have been rolled up uh, as yeah. the Transfiguration was when it went to Paris and uh, brutally. Damage the process. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Abby, please. I have another question about this image machine. I think it's really fascinating. And mm. you talked about how this was performative, and I wondered if these uh, altars were unfolded or switched in front of the congregants, or whether this would have been done. Would it would it have been a performance in front of the the, the believers? We have no sources yeah, about that, yeah. but of course, uh, the assumption is that it would have been a um, <coughs> public uh, sort of ritual. Clearly, uh, not as part of the liturgy, but uh, always uh, uh, the, the evening, the night before uh, uh, the festivity. But uh, I mean, this is such a spectacular. Uh, uh, thing um, bringing the altarpiece on the altar and unfolding it, uh, or also lifting or lowering uh, Titian's painting. Uh, yeah. Do we have any sense? Assume, but uh, right. the sources didn't, don't tell us. Do we have any sense of, of how whether the mechanics of these machines would have been visible? I mean, uh, I'm I'm very intrigued no. by the actual mechanics of yeah. these pulleys yeah. and ropes yeah. and so on. So they would have would would they have been things that people would have been able to see, or would it have been sort of magical seeming? Yeah, more uh, the latter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also in, in San Marco, it's 
is a rather a hidden mechanism, uh, hidden in the ciborium uh, architecture. Yeah. And thank you for your talk. I was very fascinated by this on this question of the brightness of the garment, this divine brightness uh, unbearable for human uh, gaze. And also considering the question of iconography of these figures, uh, the apostles that are um, protecting their gaze or reacting so yeah. strongly, yeah. I was wondering if a parallel could be useful with the resurrection, where you have a kind of similar yeah. reaction. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, now I don't know the theological debate that is behind this, but in that case, uh, Christ <coughs> is not uh, dressed, uh, so the the light is not coming from the, the garment, but it's also after the resurrection. So also because uh, on the top of the, yeah. the altar, yeah, yeah, it says that you have so um, Christ resurrected. Yeah. So I well, think, I think you're, all the yeah. things are related. Uh, this is an uh, important uh, aspect. Yeah. Especially for Titian, I, I would say. Uh, yes, when we think back uh, of the festivities when uh, the Pala del Centro was uh, on display, it was also on Easter, for example, and uh, clearly um, and, um, this transfiguration uh, image could also be uh, understood as, well, as a kind of promise also, um, I mean the transfiguration has always been understood in this way, it's a promise of the resurrection um, and also I mean, <coughs> after perhaps Easter Sunday when uh, Titian's uh, uh, canvas was lifted up, mm. uh, of course uh, this would have been uh, what reminded everyone uh, of uh, the resurrection. Yeah. But it's interesting because in the resurrection, it's not uh, the disciples who are overwhelmed, but the Roman soldiers. Which, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, there is no cloud to protect. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. I mean, there um, is no need for a cloud uh, anymore uh, because this is uh, one um, step. Ahead, uh, yeah, and, and this uh, process of uh, well, Christ, uh, Christ um, becoming revealed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it bears. I mean, bears the question. Then you know, we all know, let's say, the artist Titian. But to what extent we can actually think, start thinking here about collaborative work, and to what extent commissioning something like that is actually. You talk about an image machine, so yeah. we will talk maybe about a, 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 you know, a communal production of, of kind of a form of enchantment in which there's a lot of thinking before the actual making of the yeah. painting itself. Yeah. Uh, to and, and it didn't really discuss, but to the design of the marble and and, yeah. and, the, and, the, and the and the and the the, the other uh, parts of, of this uh, of this altar. So I was wondering where is then the place of the artist or, or the manufacturer within this? Elaborative scheme of, of, of uh, techniques and, and, met and different 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 media even. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, again, we have no uh, sources, unfortunately, about this uh, process. So it's all hypotheses. Uh, um, I mean, of course, it's, uh, the the framework uh, for the painting was uh, constructed or designed by another uh, person, so of course uh, there must have been some ideas of how this painting should look like, of which function it should fulfill uh, in this place, of course. And, um, well, as I said in my paper, Titian is not acting as an autonomous uh, Artist here. Mm -hmm. uh, he's part of uh, um, yes, of a collaborative um, a project. Yeah. Coming back to the, the end question, maybe yours. After all this journey, if you can say more about the Raphael transfiguration, and I was thinking that there is another hidden character in the story, which is Michelangelo. 
because the drawings for the Sebastian yeah. were provided. And so I was thinking the, the clothing of the naked figure like uh, could be also conversation with Michelangelo in the sense that there is a it's not the body which is important, but it's the garment. So if you could if you think that it's possible to introduce these other <laughs> also in terms of collaboration, because of course there was a collaboration between Sebastian and Michelangelo in that case to yeah. fit to, yeah. to, to contrast Raphael yeah. 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 So oh. just because you started with Raphael <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course uh, well I wouldn't say that uh, in this case uh, um, the drawings were no, considered by Raphael as being um, no, 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 something peculiar to, to Michelangelo, no, 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 uh, no. because I think all the drawings show us that... Of course, um, yes, no, that I know, but I was just yeah. asking, my question is about the use of the clothes uh, yeah. in the painting as a um, sort of new kind of body, which is clothed, uh, not in relation to the drawings, because you always represent uh, naked... Yeah, 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 yeah. But just in terms of um, a different kind of body that he wants to present. As uh -huh. opposed to Michelangelo's body, that uh -huh. often more naked. Uh -huh. Well, this <laughs> more, uh, clearly would be true of uh, this Christ figure, um, which uh, I mean, he, he studied a Christ body very well as a naked figure, and then he decided to, to represent him clothed, and uh, it's such a waste of. of effort <laughs> and um, moreover he decided to uh, make this garment uh, very large uh, um, sort of cloudy uh, very large um, uh, garment uh, so the the body is completely hidden here uh, but it also from the face and from the how to say the, the behavior of the posture uh, of Christ, um, one would say that this is a rather feminine or feminine, uh, feminine perhaps, um, uh, type of Christ figure here, which is, yes, one could say a sort of opposite of what, how Michelangelo would uh, have imagined uh, uh, Christ, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I am not an art historian, but I, I'm curious about the female figure in the foreground, <laughs> the sort of whiteness of her yeah. skin, where you know Christ's skin yeah. is not white. Um, so whiteness is a property of the garment um, in his case, but then in her case, it's, it seems to be emanating from her skin. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, uh, this figure very often is interpreted as um, a Mary Magdalene, um, which would have created another link to uh, Sebastian de Piombo's painting, where the raising of Lazarus is, is represented. Uh, and yes, I mean, what we see here is very misleadingness. <laughs> um, little to do with. Uh, um, the, the shades in the, in the original painting. Um, I mean, in the original painting, the Christ figure is uh, the um, brightest uh, 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 area of the painting. Um, here it seems to be it's, uh, Mac Mary Magdalene seems to be in, in a second um, Pole or center of brightness. Um, well, I mean, she belongs to um, to the possessed uh, lunatic boy here, and for me, it's this um, polarity between uh, dressed and hovering Christ figure and uh, this uh, boy here. Um, and he is also a represented semi mute. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, David, thank you very much. Yeah. more wine um, nibbled outside so if you want to join